before we get started, uh, why don't I tell our panelists to introduce themselves to you quickly, and then uh, we'll get started. So go ahead, Gary. My name is Gary Ornstein. I'm the Chief Product and Marketing Officer at Yellow Brick Data. We make the Yellow Brick Data Warehouse. Before that, I was at a company called MemSQL, which makes a scalable SQL database. And I've spent about the last 20 years doing marketing and product for data center infrastructure companies. Manish Gupta, I'm the CMO at Redis Labs. We are an in-memory database. I've uh, over 20 years of technology marketing experience. Hi, everybody. My name is Sam Fell. I'm Vice President of Marketing at Electric Cloud. We're a DevOps pipeline and tooling company uh, that helps people release tomorrow's software more safely uh, with a lot less anxiety and uh, a lot more quickly. Um, so this session was called uh, Marketing to Developers. And after a lot of discussion, we decided to change it to unmarketing to developers uh, because the theory is that developers don't like to be marketed. What are your thoughts, guys? Well, I'll start by when I got the invitation to the panel, when it was maybe still marketing to developers, uh, I said, well, first and foremost, I don't believe in marketing to developers, so maybe I shouldn't be on the panel. <laughs> um, but I think what, what happens is we have products that are very driven by classic enterprise buying cycles, and we have products that are driven by developer adoption. And products can fit into generally you know, one of those categories. And then folks have to couple, uh, or companies have to couple how they approach the market, hopefully by the same uh, approach. But, but that's very confusing. It's easy for us to talk about an abstract, uh, but getting an entire company of hundreds or thousands of people to be aligned with you know, how do we define the product and how do we define the go-to-market is, I think, where a lot of the challenge lies. Anything else to add? Yeah, um, you know, you have to inform and educate this community and this persona. I think any time your communication ends up being marketing in nature and look and feel or even smell, I think you will alienate that audience in a heartbeat. You know, we serve... Um, we serve over 8,500 customers, and on top of that, we have 80 plus thousand developers that are on our free, free service. Some of these come to us and just sign up, zero touch. So there is absolutely zero engagement with the sales team, and that's half of our business. The other half is your classic enterprise sales, where you have a standard sales cycle, you have got high touch environment, but the communication that goes out from marketing and the engagement that we have from the marketing team looks and smells very different. And I think it has to. Otherwise, you just don't get the engagement in the long term. Absolutely. So we uh, have solutions that help span the whole gamut from the dev side of the house over to ops. So we really create that. That pipeline becomes a collaboration point and a conduit. Um, marketing uh, the enterprise sort of way to, uh, to the operation side of the house is a pretty natural motion. But as you mentioned, the developers don't want to be marketed to. They want to learn something. Uh, and so to the extent that uh, we've provided opportunities for them to learn more, uh, DevOps is a lot about automation. It's a lot about um, trying to eliminate the need to have humans doing things that we're not so good at, which is repeatedly pressing a button over and over again. We get pretty bored with that pretty quickly. Uh, the other side of that, though, with DevOps is that humans are really important in this process to be able to synthesize the, the right way to lean out or optimize that delivery mechanism. And so by providing the developers a way to work with their peers on the operations side, by giving the operations people the knowledge of what the developers are doing, we find that is a great way to get people uh, familiar with our product without necessarily having to sell anything to them. And if you can, if you can make people familiar with a space or a methodology, or uh, a new way of working and give them that without asking them to purchase your product, uh, then you're in a pretty good spot to be able to have some influence on their journey. So Gary, uh, you know, Manish says that, uh, you know, it's a zero touch sales to developers and you said you hate selling to developers. So, you know, why not take that such a good sweet spot? How much revenue comes out of the zero touch? I think you get the adoption there, right? You get a starting for revenue. Half of the revenue comes from zero, which is very impressive. It's a very developer-centric product, right? So I think the, 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 the challenge is ultimately the big money in technology is these large enterprise sales. 
I think you'd be hard pressed to to name a company outside of acquisition, where sometimes people are buying access to these folks. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a company that went from startup land through IPO purely on a developer centric marketing and sales cycle. I just I did, maybe that's happened. Maybe somebody. Is there any uh, you guys can think of? No, I think that's right. That's right. So. You know, as we think about the journey for the company, it started out as a 100% zero-touch business. Right. And it was geared towards enabling an experience for the developer which did not require a call from marketing team, call from a sales team, or a negotiation with the sales team. You go, you sign up, you experience, you get a free service, and as your needs expand, you become a paid customer. That was a journey, and it's truly zero-touch. And the company scaled with that. But to get to the next level, to become a public company, to get to 100 million, 200 million revenue, uh, it, you, uh, we could not have reached there. Yeah. We could not have. So, so Gary, yeah. you're right. I mean, but there are a few, right? Uh, Atlassian is probably one of yep. the greatest That's examples. That's the one I was going to mention, yeah. Right? <laughs> so go ahead. Why don't you talk about that one? No, I've, you, just, uh, you talk about a company that's really, really good at uh, getting incremental adoption of technology on the development side and figuring out how to corral all those departmental sales into a larger conversation. Right. Atlassian's definitely figured that out. So there's one. But let me tell you about ServiceNow, or Slack. let me tell you Slack about the other one. <laughs> uh, Workday, or let me tell you about Okta, or let me tell you about this plethora of SaaS companies that, that are doing really well with you know, $10, $20 billion valuations, all because they took a very enterprise-centric approach to their product in terms of the selling motion, even though it often appeals to the developer. And you know, my point is, I, I think people get confused about the language. Uh, we probably all agree that marketing in the traditional sense to developers is the great strategy. I, I think that's why I don't use that term at all. That's very different from creating a frictionless developer experience, which I think is paramount to success in any technology market. So a lot of this is just nuance of terms and terminology, but sometimes when you need to get 100 people or 300 people moving in the same direction, the words you choose matter. And so that's why I differentiate between developer marketing, which I don't think is a very good use of time, compared to creating a phenomenal developer experience, which I think should be an attribute of, of any product uh, growth strategy. Uh, so uh, before I go to the next question, I just want to let everyone know that if you want to ask any questions, there are people in the back with cards. And so raise your hands and uh, put your questions on the card, and uh, we'll take it up depending on the availability of time. Uh, so, you know, you, you talked about creating a frictional developer experience. What does that really mean, and who do you think has done a really great job with that? I will say frictionless, yeah. right? Uh, but, but, but let's have Manish talk about it, because Manish has proof in the pudding. Yeah, he's got 50% of his revenue coming from that, so that's yep. impressive. You know, I 100% agree that you want to uh, deliver an experience where the value proposition does its talk through the technology and the experience and not because a sales guy was able to sell you, right? That's, that's really, really paramount in the developer engagement. What, what we have done is we have enabled the experience of the value prop of a technology through multiple channels. And, and that's what our, uh, the, the engine and the investment we do for developer marketing, developer sales, whatever you want to call it, uh, is around that. For example, on the website, you can go in and you can truly experience the experience of putting your data in the database, setting it up, and all of that happens in less than five minutes. You can then attend a workshop that we have. We just started a university called Redis University. Another example, you can, you can take six courses in the university, all free, all free. So, you know, frictionless all the way from, does it cost you anything? Is it in, on your terms? Is it on your time? Is it something that you enjoy and you don't? You can certainly walk out. Um, we invest a lot of money in developer conference, you know, things that are day long perhaps or three days long. All of those intended to enable that seamless experience for the developer without us actually interjecting our messaging or thrusting upon them what we believe is good for them. Let them experience and come to their own conclusion. Uh, so just building on this, it is zero touch, all right, but I'm sure the customer acquisition cost is still pretty high. So what does a typical customer acquisition cost look like for a developer-only zero touch sale? Yeah, so you know the cost there, uh, for the zero touch sale, it is much lower than it is for the high touch, the other side, which is the enterprise side, as you would expect. Um, the sales cycles are short. 
I, I think the trade-off we end up making is the deal sizes are much smaller in the zero touch than the other side of the house, and hence we are seeing the growth there. Um, you know, the cost of acquisition is, is sometimes very hard to pin in a zero touch market because you know, the digital dimension is very easy. The non-digital dimension, which is around things I've talked about, Redis University, the events that we do, the workshops that we do, all of that, uh, they don't have a very good attribution model, at least not so far, uh, in, in how we are set up uh, to have that. But it is dramatically lower than the high touch model. So um, I know that all of you market to developers at some point in your career. So tell me kind of one thing you did that you regret was really backfired. What was that? Um, I'll go first. That's fine. Uh, so it's actually one of the things that we've done that's worked really well. It's also been one of the things that hasn't worked very well. Uh, we're not an open source solution. Um, we're, uh, but we do have a community edition of our product, which is fantastic for giving people the opportunity to play with the product, to experience it, to get it uh, useful and, and providing value in their organizations. Uh, but a lot of our sales motions, we sell uh, to very large organizations with really complex problems. And so what we found is sometimes this freemium, this community model, will get in the way of a natural um, engagement at the enterprise level when we're trying to sell a larger deal. And so internally, there's a lot of friction between marketing and sales around what the right strategy should be and whether or not this is actually sort of, if we're the, the anti-sales department by letting people play with the product. Uh, product management is obviously very supportive of it. We're very proud of our product. We're Gartner leading uh, solution in our space. So having people, our opinion is that having people experience the product and especially developers, that we're not trying to hoodwink them, we're not trying to, to you know, trick them into using something. We have a very valuable product and we want people to be using it. But the, the downside of that is that at the last minute, somebody can go and download it and say, well, you know what, we're not going to buy today. We're just going to play with it for six months. And then I get a head, a head full of uh, emails and things from people. I'm laughing because I've been through a similar experience. And you know, while it's easy when you're brainstorming with the product team about, oh, we'll just launch a light version, or we'll just launch a community version, or we'll just feature cap this thing or that thing, mm -hmm. it's so easy to talk about that with your friends around the conference room table. When you get out into the field and you're training salespeople and you're trying to bring on new salespeople, every little bit that they have to delineate between one thing or the next is adding friction to your cycle. And so I think you know, building solidarity of the strategy and the approach, how are we gonna treat this as a developer-oriented product, as an enterprise-oriented product, how are we gonna match our go-to-market strategy in a developer mindset and an enterprise mindset, that Man which is more people management than even technology management or developer management mm -hmm. is so critical to, uh, to, to providing and propelling growth. Actually, building on that, it looks like between sales and marketing in a developer-oriented uh, company, the tensions will probably be pretty high, especially for you, Manish, I'm sure, because the 50% no-touch revenue goes to marketing while the 50% touch revenue goes to sales. Yeah. You know, we like to believe 100% of it is because of marketing. But, uh, and I'm sure everyone in the room will agree with that. I hope your VP of sales is not sitting here. <laughs> you know, we shouldn't forget that in, in an enterprise sale, you know, it's not an individual persona that, that ends up closing. It's a, it's a buying center or a buying group that comprises of multiple functions. And, and what has changed, I would say, over the last 10 years is in, in any enterprise. You know, it used to be where the CIO has made a decision that you must go with a platform X, and then everybody follows and, and executes to that, right? I think over the last few years, the developer persona has taken a life of its own. And in many ways, if you don't have the viral buy-in and, and the broad spectrum buy-in by the developer community, the, the CIOs or the VPs of engineering simply are not in a position to make it an edict and, and run that way. And, and so the power that's, that resides with the developers is very, 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 very large. And I think, you know, to your question, Paul, about sales and marketing alignment, um, it, it, I think the sales team that have typically comes from enterprise sales the last 10 years, because they're the seasoned guys with the gray hair and they know how to do this thing, you need that, but you need retooling and retraining of the sales guys. Because they are very good and they know how to go tops down and, and work across the organization, but you're trying to flip the model now. And the flip the model is, you know, 60, 70, 80% of the buying journey is done online before the first sales touch happens. 
And I think with that, the influence that comes from this self-touch, self-training, self-engagement is, is really important. The frictionless experience is foundational. So, so the alignment between sales and marketing starts at that level. How do we deliver that kind of experience of value proposition yourself? And then we enable the sales team with a very different mindset. And I think when we get there, if and when we get there, which is not always easy, uh, I, I think you, you get great results. The velocity of closure from the first touch to actual closure becomes much better. Uh, when you don't get the alignment, then, then it's, it's a much harder thing. But how, how do you message in a company which sells to these two audiences? Because I see a lot of time companies get, you know, like you go to Oracle's website and it is probably the most confusing website you will ever do. And But they say, oh, what persona are you? Why don't you select? Yeah, and yeah. then I'll give you the stuff that you should get. I'll give you an example. We, we experience every day. You know, in my team, I have developer advocates, I have developer evangelists. These are people that are told every day, do not market, do not sell. So they will go and run a workshop and the sales guys are there hanging out because they want to convert those folks and there is a constant battle between the developer advocate that's running the workshop that simply wants to inform and educate this crowd. The sales team, on the other hand, could really care less about that because they want to go and get a PO, right? That's what their job is. And I think trying to get these folks to work together to understand that that sales is not going to happen today, but it gets you the value proposition is already inherent. So when you do get the touch, you know, that might be two months later, you're going to get that deal faster, maybe larger, because you now have bought in the, the internals of the developer, right? And you respected, and I think that's the engagement. And you respected their time, and you respected their space, and they weren't ready maybe at the time, but you were providing value for free and not asking anything. Who doesn't like free value? How many of you are here today? Right. You're all, actually, you're all here. I can prove it. Um, and you're all here, and you're all getting a lot of value out of these conversations. We're not trying to sell you anything. Right? That's a very natural, genuine, authentic conversation that we've shared. And I've gotten a lot of LinkedIn invitations from people uh, from this show already. And these are people that now I have something in common with. I'm a lot more likely to connect with someone from this show than some random person who hits me up saying, hey, I see your VP of marketing. I want to try and sell you something. Not that I'm going to try and sell anybody anything. Just putting that out there. Uh, so um, this is a question from the audience. What, what is the pricing model that uh, you have seen work for the zero-touch developer uh, systems? And, and we may not be a classic example for all software companies because we are based on open source and then we have a highly differentiated enterprise version. So we have a three-tier approach. Uh, the first one is, is open source. You go to GitHub, you download, and, you, and you're off and running. You don't even need to talk to Redis Labs, right? Um, obviously, that's not, we would like everybody to come to us. Uh, but that's the first tier. The second tier is you can go to redislabs.com, get up and running as I said, in five minutes, experience the whole thing, and up to a certain amount of, uh, of data usage, you can continue running as a, as a free service. So that's the second piece. The, the, the third piece, which is a true way how we monetize the company, uh, and, and we typically see the journey happen, not always, but in most cases go through those steps, is uh, it's two things. is an SLA, the performance operations per second, and then the second one is the amount of data. So very, very simple, and, and you have to keep it very simple. It's, it, it's got to be simple, dead simple. Yeah, I, I might also add, you, know, you really have to think hard when you're pricing a product about what label you want to put on it at first. And you know, if you put open source as the first definition of the product, you've essentially put a big zero dollar sign, you know, on your forehead. And that's, now you're starting from zero as opposed to, you know, some preconceived notion of, of a certain dollar amount. So I, I think you, you, people get stuck in that, in that they, they think, oh, it'll just happen, it'll just transpire. But I think there are cases where if you're, you're you know, too focused on just adopting with, with, without some transaction, a monetary transaction involved, that, that can also have adverse effects in some cases. Hmm. And to the extent that you can push the conversation forward, the further left you can have the conversation with somebody, whether it's an implicit one or an explicit one, about whether they're going to buy something is good. And so if you put limitations, it's much easier to give more later uh, than it is to take anything away. So this, we went through this with our community edition is where do we start? How do we start putting this thing out there with the understanding that our sales teams wanted us to give nothing away and the product manager wanted us to give everything away because it's their product and they were so proud of it and they wanted everyone to use it and why wouldn't they want to use it? Um, so making sure that you understand 
the dynamic there and it's really difficult to take things away from the free users um, may help inform how you get started with that process. So um, here's a question from the audience. Uh, you know, it's, it's fine in terms of, you know, marketing to developers or unmarketing as we may call it. Uh, what about CTOs and head of technical departments or director of engineering? What's, what's the best thing that works for them? Dollars, saving money is often a big thing. I mean, you can look at any of the uh, big analyst firm surveys about these folks. And, you know, it wavers between uh, revenue growth, uh, building a better customer experience, and saving money. It, the, the themes don't change very often, even though the technologies do. I think the higher up in the organization that you are attempting to penetrate, the more you want to push uh, an economic message. Uh, that, that's how people it, you know, tend to do well in these companies is you know, driving revenue growth up and driving costs down. But whenever you try to focus on uh, you know, cost saving, that there doesn't ever seem to be an urgency in the organization. So how do you create that urgency? So I think you've got to find the right, uh, you know, th yeah, there's times when people are, are not cost conscious. There are times when people are cost conscious. Uh, it goes in cycles. I think there's also times when people look at, it, it shifts. So, you know, we're, we're in a period right now where people are, you know, cloud, 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 cloud. But, you know, some people who are very successful in their deployments are now saying, whoa, $200,000 a month on cloud. What, 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 wait a second. So let's have a discussion. So let's ha so now there's an opportunity there about how am I going to cut that cloud bill from two hundred thousand dollars a month down, you know, fifty percent. So it, it depends on where you catch people in the technology cycle. Uh, so looking at the, you know, if uh, another question from the audience is, can you compare in terms of spending money on SCM conferences and everything else that you do in a traditional company versus the one that is marketing to developers. So where do you put your marketing dollars, even though it's called unmarketing, but that's fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what I find in sort of Redis Labs experience versus some of the other prior experience I've had is where the developer angle was much smaller or didn't exist, is um, I've had to add many more channels to my marketing mix than I've done before. And, you know, I talked about the resource in the team itself, having developer advocates, you know, I've got to pick, put them in different geographies, developer evangelists. I've got to have technical folks that can speak the developer language at the same time they understand the value proposition that has to be permeated, right? So it's a different resource set, uh, an incremental set of channels that weren't necessarily needed if you don't have this, uh, this persona target. Um, and, and I find the events bucket, the training bucket, tends to have a much larger portion of my budget now uh, than it had been the case in, in, in other environments. Um, so, you know, tell me kind of one marketing strategy that really worked very well for you guys in yeah. marketing to develop. I'll, I'll go back to, you know, uh, this, we, we started doing what we call uh, Redis Enterprise Developer Workshops. Uh, they are, uh, they're meant to be training, but they're on the enterprise platform as opposed to the open source piece. And we get anywhere between 50 to 200 people show up, spend the day with us. And I think when people leave that day, and if they get a call from sales guy at some point, or there's, they find themselves in that conversation, it's a much, much more friendly conversation. It, it is much, much more, you know, I learned that, or that I, it wasn't clear to me, can you get me the solution architect to help me further with that? Or, interestingly enough, we get a lot more follow-ups directly from those guys. It's you a know, warm can lead I now. extend it? And, and I think that has been the, by far the best return on the investment. How about um, any of you? I, I want to, if you don't mind, I want to go back and answer that, uh, that first question about how do you, how do you market to uh, someone who may be higher up in the organization. And I think that the cost savings is a very interesting thing. But I talk with a lot of executives who say, right now, my problem isn't money. I have more money than I do time. And my competition seems to be getting a jump on me in, with product. So the way that we try and help them understand the value proposition is to say, you know, what if you could move faster than your competition? It's not about cost savings, it's that lost opportunity that you're just, you're fettering away all of this time, and time is the one thing that you can never ever get back. So what if you could release that software today that you're going to be releasing next quarter? What does that do to your projections and to your revenue, right? 
so here is a question which is somewhat not related to this topic but came from the audience, so I'll take it, which is, um, what do you guys think about Red Hat and IBM and is it really an industry changing event for startups? I'm in the middle of that, let me take, let me start there. So this whole topic of open source, you know, I think of this deal has really made open source truly, truly mainstream. We all know Red Hat got started with Linux a long time ago and the business model was very simple. Open source needs support if you're going to deploy it, right? So they provided support. That's how it started. Over the last 20 years, we've seen that model actually doesn't work. There aren't many open source companies that have taken open source, provided support, and become you know, public companies. That hasn't happened much. And in fact, when we started Redis Labs, we were very, very you know, clear about the value of open source and how open source is going to become pervasive. There is no enterprise that can survive today without having an open source component to it. Whether they do it themselves, whether they leverage open source, doesn't matter. Cloud, non-cloud, doesn't really matter. Uh, I think the issue is how do you monetize the company? And, and, and I'm not talking about selling like Red Hat was able to sell the company, but I'm talking about how do you generate revenue and how do you in, build the enterprise value, whether you become a public company and get acquired. Uh, so this transaction, and by the way, it's, it's, it's one of many transactions. Over the last six months, maybe seven months now, $53 billion worth of equity has exchanged hands in, in this. Of course, Red Hat IBM is the largest one. MuleSoft, acquired by sales of $6 billion, uh, was another one. Cloudera, Hortonworks, merging together is another one. And, and there are a number of others, right? CA. So uh, That's right, yeah. And so these examples all sort of happening now, um, I think it, uh, some of it is coincidence, but it makes one thing very clear. Open source is not just for fun and games. Open source is real business. There's real enterprise value there. I think it's a little bit less about the open source aspect than it is that IBM lost the cloud war and had to figure out how they could make themselves relevant. And uh, the best underlying glue that's pervasive across all of these cloud deployments is Linux and the engine around managing and dealing with all of these Linux instances and Red Hat has built up an ecosystem of tools and technologies to help shepherd that. And so, so you know, that, that's what IBM was forced to do. Actually, I have had this question for a long time myself, is uh, how was IBM able to position Red Hat as a cloud deal? Because if you think about it, you know, Red Hat is really just a tool set. It is not a cloud company by any stretch of the imagination. So how did they manage to position it that way? You know, you know when you're a big old company like IBM, you can say things and just they become so you say enough number of times that so people yeah. start you know, we're, lear we're learning that, you know, people in places just say things and, and they try to become facts. Uh, IBM can still do that. IBM can make an announcement every five years. We're investing $3 billion in this new technology and they'll get hundreds of press stories about it. Well, you know, all they do is move a little money from here to over here. No big deal. Uh, but uh, it was amazing how they were able to, in the, 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 the breadth of a news release, declare Red Hat to be the crown jewels of hybrid cloud. Uh, good for them, you know, good marketing from IBM's perspective. I can tell you this, it's not gonna make them take over AWS. So uh, coming back, uh, one more question uh, from the audience, that when you're in a company which is marketing to developers, how do you get marketing to get a voice in a company like that? Because I'm sure developers just say, I don't want to listen to these guys. One thing's clear, CMO title doesn't help with developers. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it's, it's very true and, and you know, going back to there, are several people in my team that don't have a marketing title on purpose. On purpose. You know, their jobs are at the end of the day marketing but they don't have a marketing title. So it's like you maintain two cards, one for outside, no, one for inside. No, yeah. I think there's a lot of retooling and retraining that goes on and the mindset and, and how it's communicated externally. It's very, very important because, you know, simple examples, when they submit an abstract for speaking you know, things to the community, if it says marketing in it, no matter how good the abstract is, it doesn't get accepted. So you just so. call yourself <laughs> chief evangelist. Yeah, so I think the, the different approaches to it, but yeah, marketing as a title or anywhere in that conversation doesn't help. Yeah, but the budget rests with you. Yeah, Absolutely. It, Absolutely. There's simple things I think anyone can do who's launching a product to make it more friendly. And, you know, just a simple thing like making sure the documentation makes it to the website, right? That's, developers love it. Just, just, I just want to read the docs, right? So that, that's also something that, that is e relatively easy to do. And, and just make sure that, you know, be transparent, put the docs right there on the website, and you're already, you know, 
on your way to making those folks uh, more, more happy about the content they're consuming. All right, I think we've run out of our time. Thank you very much. Thank you.